Welcome. Welcome to the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia and to the Department of Russian and Slavic Studies. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm going to introduce our speakers. We're very grateful um, to them for sharing their time with us. And I know it's going to be really interesting. So first, I think we're going to start off with um, Professor Stephen Cohen, who is a Meredith Professor at NYU and at Princeton, Russian History and Politics, I think most of you already know him. Um, ambassador Kerry Kavanaugh, former US Ambassador. Um, uh, Jeremy Faust, Master's Candidate at Moscow, in in Moscow State Institute of International Relations. Um, Mr. Leon Geyer, translator and Sandy Krolik, Dr. Sandy Krolik, who's a retired USA executive and former professor. So thank you all and very Randy much. Randy Bregman. Oh, I'm oh. so sorry. Yes. I, I skipped you. Randy Bregman, Senior Counsel, Denton's US LLP. I asked you all those questions, and then I skipped you. And um, I think that we'll let everybody say a few words, and then there'll be question and answer. Although, because Professor Cohen has to go, I think we'll do his Q&A directly after his talk. OK? Thank you. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. Would you start or is that it? You can <laughs> just start. Yes, okay. So I apologize for having to leave early. I much prefer to stay here because this interests me much more than the entirely bureaucratic and uh, ceremonial event at which I'm obliged to appear tonight. I promise you I don't want to go, but everybody from the organizers to my wife said I better. I didn't go last year because I was out of the country, but I'm afraid they may see me on the street and I can't tell them this <laughs> So I do have to go, but I, I, this subject actually interests me, and I'd like to hear what everybody says, so I'll ask them for giving in advance for going. So I stumbled a bit uh, over this word career. As you know, career, the word, can have pejorative meanings in English and in Russian, as in, oh, he just did it for his career, or he's a careerist. Uh, so I looked it up in, in Webster's, and it says it means a profession or an occupation as a life work. And that seems, I, I sort of lean toward avocation or profession rather than, than career. But it's certainly the case that for me, Russian studies has been a career, a vocation in the formal sense, in the academic sense. I mean, there are a lot of things you can do in Russian studies, and you'll hear about some of them this evening. But I chose academic life, partly by accident. And uh, it has been a lifetime, even in quasi-retirement, uh, vocation or career in the dictionary sense of the word. I had tenured professorships at two universities, Princeton and then here at NYU, very good universities both, which prized Russian studies, and both of which so uh, the teaching load was substantial in both places, not for me when I finally came here because I was part-time, but it was substantial. Nonetheless, both places uh, went out of their way, especially for young academics, to be sure they have time to do the research and the publication and all the things that you have to do if you want to make, quote, a career in academic studies, which means get tenure eventually. So I have been lucky and I guess successful in that sense. I also had, and this was entirely accidental, or maybe not, I'll say a word about that at the end, access to the American mass media. Partly because we can always count on Cold War with Russia, or vice versa, and the media is more or less obsessed with Russia, and has been since I was your age, a graduate student, in all the wrong ways, though sometimes it gets interested in things other than the Cold War aspects, but luckily or otherwise, I had a second career in the media. And believe it or not, for almost 12 years, I was paid. Imagine this. I mean, when you look at talk TV tonight, you wonder, does anybody actually pay these people? But I was actually paid, and paid it stupidly well uh, for 10 years by CBS, which enabled me to put two children through private schools in New York, which I couldn't have paid the tuition without going into debt. So I, you're looking not only at a loan-free student, but a loan-free father. Thanks for the Russia and the CBS. Uh, and having access to a lot of people on television could be at times, despite all the ugly mail, a rewarding thing. You meet a lot of people, interesting people, uh, and so it broadens your own perspectives. For me, though, 
I think it's fair to say that Russian studies, as an academic field, uh, became a life more than a career. And that's really the point of what I want to say very briefly. It became a life, uh, an unexpected life, I guess. I think there's a Cone Brother film by that name, isn't there? An unexpected life. Anybody a fan of the Cone Brothers? No. C O E N, Fargo. <coughs> anyway, I digress. Uh, it, it became more, it became a lot. I won't explain how this happened, we don't have time. I'm going to stay within my 10 minutes. But because of Russia, uh, I uh, journeyed from a small town in Kentucky where I grew up, or what Russians call the provinces. Mm -hmm. They all get hysterical when they find out I'm a I told the provinces, that's what you said. More than the provinces in the Kupiat and I So <laughs> it's, uh, but it was, uh, I did grow up there, and because of Russia, I ended up in New York, and then in New York on to Moscow, and again, and again, and again. And over the decades, my family, uh, my wife and my children, have mingled with Russian families. So an extent, you know how Russians are about families. When they adopt you, they really adopt mm -hmm. you. And so I have, because of Russia, had, in some ways, because my parents died very young, uh, closer families. Mm -hmm. Bukharin's widow, I wrote a biography of Bukharin, and Bukharin and Larna, considered me her pre only son, her adopted son. And the fact is my mother had died so young that I kind of embraced this idea that she wasn't my mother, but she was motherly. And, and so Russia gave me all of this. And the same true with my youngest daughter, who's now 28, Nika, who traveled with us, with my wife and I, on all these trips to Russia and became part of those extended families. So much so that she was absolutely convinced until very, very recently, she's now 28, that Gorbachev uh, is, is, was her godfather. <laughs> the question I guess, because we saw Gorbachev so much, we became part of his extended family. So he just, she just assumed that was her godfather until we had this long conversation. And actually it was, this is my wife's choice, Yevgeny Tushenko, the late poet, was my daughter's godfather for reasons that are too bizarre to explain. But nonetheless, the point is, is that because of Russia, I got a life I wouldn't have had otherwise. I met my companion and wife of 40 years, Katrina Bandit, who will now be editor and director and publisher of the nation because of Russia. Uh, along the way, I got to know a number of world leaders, including the first President Bush. I, mean, I, I didn't know him like intimately, but I saw him frequently for a period of time. That was interesting. I mean, I was able to observe things at a high level I wouldn't have been able to otherwise. And I became especially co uh, close, as I said, to Gorbachev. So close to my daughter thinks she's her uh, godfather. How did this happen? Which brings me to the subject. How does a kid who grew up in Kentucky, uh, who initially and delusionally aspired to be a professional golfer, <laughs> as, as I did until I was 17 and had a rude shock, uh, if you're interested in this, it's, you, can, you can Google it. I actually wrote a, an article how, on how I quit professional golf for Russia. Uh, it was very bad. It happened in Paducah, Kentucky. But did it, how did it happen that a kid who grew up in Kentucky ends up in Moscow and with a wife with Russia? Well, I didn't think about this seriously for many, many years. But I did on May Day, uh, 1989, when for reasons too bizarre to go into, the Gorbachev government actually asked me, invited me, told me, depending on how you look at it, to speak for 10 minutes on national television from Red Square on May Day, 1989. And I did. And afterwards, after this surreal experience, my friends and I repaired to an apartment to drink and to discuss how this had happened. And mm -hmm. the, the question became, how did you, having grown up in Kentucky, end up on speaking on Red Square? It was a good way to frame it. And as you would imagine, if you've studied Russia and Russians long enough, the discussion became a clash of political cultures. So I said, we were about eight of us, I guess, sitting and drinking down in the apartment, oh, it was all a, a series of nislučanists, nis accidents, half stances. I mean, I don't know. I just did certain things, and I really wasn't thinking, and there I ended up on this one. And they vehemently said, absolutely not. And you, you already know what they all said. No, absolutely not. From the beginning, this was your fate. <laughs> this was your fate. And I was not a fate sort of guy by disposition, but I have to say that lately, rethinking my life, and you do that when you get old, you start sort of going back, and there's a song about this, 
about regrets. But anyway, you have your regrets and your non-regrets. And maybe they were right. Maybe it was my fate. Though I remain unsure, which means I get now to my point and my end. I don't have much helpful advice for those of you who may decide to make Russian Russian studies in your career, and therefore I think almost inevitably because Russia is demanding and embracing uh, your life. The only advice I could give you is explore and embrace Russia as fully as you possibly can beyond your own narrow specialization. Uh, scholars of my generation, and maybe one generation younger, whom I also know, I have noticed that many don't venture into what things Russian much beyond their specialization. A very famous person, but I will not mention her, made a dissertation career writing a dissertation about weapons transfers between Moscow and Prague. And this person later became an advisor to a president. And discussing Russia with this person, I do believe that person never knew anything about Russia other than weapons transfers to Prague. <laughs> I mean, my first advice is to you, don't do that. I mean, embrace Russia as fully as you can. Secondly, don't be deterred, deterred or discouraged by any torments that Russian behavior may inflict on you. Russia will behave badly by maybe not your standards, but by the standards of your neighbors. That's almost for sure. And you really have to develop a kind of shrug attitude toward that. You can say, oh, well, they're Russians. Uh, that's what my daughter said. Oh, he's a Russian. I mean, that explains everything. I mean, Russians will be Russians. But you can get distracted and tormented. But you can also get distracted and tormented by your fellow Americans who are very quick to slur people who hold views about Russia and American-Russian relations different from their views. And it can be unpleasant. But in the long run, uh, it's not very important, though I think you need to know if you go forward to a career and a life with Russia, and you do so in the United States, that we are a country that seems to have a Cold War, even Russophobic, way of thinking that recurs and recurs and recurs. And it may be that it's permanent. Because events bring it to the surface, but it's always there. I mean, I take the view the Cold War never ended. There's a, I make a scholarly argument about this. If I say, oh, the Cold War ended in 1991, so, no, it didn't actually. It went into a new phase or something like this. But that's a scholarly argument. But if, and this I can testify to, and this is good news, we're a bit of luck. And I have had tons of luck, far more than I deserve, given my character. Uh, mm -hmm. The rewards of a life with Russia will, or can, if you embrace it, certainly outweigh all the torments. And that's the extent of my advice to you. I'm not sure it's something to applaud, but uh, that, that's what it is. <laughs> I really thought about this a long time because I hadn't really done so before. <coughs> and, as, um, and as mentioned, we will have a Q&A session um, at the end of the presentation, but since um, Professor Cohen has to leave early today, uh, if you have any questions for him, uh, you may ask them now. They're all so stunned. They're not <laughs> stunned. They're <laughs> absolutely stunned. A Russian historian told me at the height of Glasnost, he wasn't a very good historian, but he was an affable guy. You may have heard of him, Yuri Afanasyev. He was like a very vivid, handsome, when he loved him, historian who turned his institute into a citadel of historical Glasnost. But he always said, there are no good answers and only good questions. <laughs> and I thought about we that, and that's not such a bad way to think. We have a good question here. <laughs> um, what can you tell us about Mr. Gorbachev? What was he like? Well, he's still alive. Yeah. As when you knew him. Do you guys still talk? And he's quite ill now, and he spends his life mainly on what's, well, I shouldn't say this, but it's a kind of home clinic. He needs a lot of care. He's in his late 80s. Uh, but he, his wit, his mind, his memory are pretty good for that age. I mean, you can engage with him. Uh, Tell me how you framed your question again. Um, what was he like when you knew him? Well, I still know him. I guess that's what confused him. I mean, obviously he's changed over the years. I first met him in 1987. 
uh, when he came here for some of Reagan, and I was working for CBS, and as I say, for <coughs> various reasons, that brought me to Gorbachev. And actually, I had read uh, my biography of Nikolai Bukharin, which had been translated, but not yet published in Russia. It was a struggle over publishing it. But he looked at me and he said, oh my God, you're the son of the man who wrote the Bukharin book. And to this day, I don't know if he's joking, but he obviously thought Russian standards, anybody who writes like a 500-page book like this, had to be at least like 60 or 70 years in my mid 30 So that was how we first met. Um, you know, he's clearly what people used to call, I think Sidney Hook called this, a world historic figure. He's a man who changed history. You, you, always, you always put in the caveats that an individual doesn't change history. There are a lot of things. Social history, of course. But I think it's fair to say that had there been no, no Gorbachev in there would have been no perestroika in 1985. There would have been perestroika of a kind eventually, no question about this. But it would have been a much more conservative. And there would not have been a perestroika whose leader, at some point, we still don't know exactly when, I don't think even Talman's biography of Gorbachev answers this question, embraced the actual democratization as opposed to a kind of Khrushchev style <coughs> liberalization from above, which was good. So when I look at Gorbachev, it's no exaggeration to say, as a very bad book about him, an early book about him, was titled The Man Who Changed the World. <coughs> and I, when we talk, and he's more interested in kind of daily things and these big questions, he's heard the questions over and over and over again, and he's had a lot of second thoughts over it again. Uh, he has a lot of regrets of not doing certain things that were options, not doing certain things more quickly. Though I have made an argument to him that whereas the main criticism of him as a leader was that he moved too slowly, I have argued to him he moved too quickly. He should have been more incremental uh, for, to ward off the opposition, to, to have more social support than the rest. But, uh, at almost 80 and ill, uh, he's melancholy, but still exceedingly thoughtful. And you have this kind of out-of-world experience when you remember who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. Because physically, and to a certain extent, mentally and psychologically, he's not the Gorbachev today who changed the world. Uh, but it's a, it's, it, it's, I've considered it a privilege and an honor and a lot of luck just to have this relationship that's ongoing. And it does sadden me, of course, as his, his health fails. But, I mean, as he said to me when I turned a certain age, he said, that's a serious age. I didn't know what that meant, but he's at a serious age. I mean, right? Do we have more questions? Can I add a piece to that? Sort of what set him apart to me, and I'm in Moscow at the same time, actually. I'm in Kentucky now, weird Kentucky. You were in Kentucky too? I, I'm there now, it wasn't before. Oh. And Admiral Crowell was actually from Kentucky. He was there then yeah, too. Yeah, Crowell was from um, Gorbachev had a lot of political courage. So you meet a lot of leaders who have these great ideas, but they won't do anything with them. Gorbachev had this great idea and really saw it as the only solution for not the end of the Soviet Union, the continuation of the Soviet Union. And he and Shevardnadze together ran with that in a way that they didn't see the trouble coming ahead because they were so committed to, this is the idea, this is what's right, this is what we should do. And they went down a path where they became on thinner and thinner ground. And as you said, yeah, and that I, part hurt him. But the courage is the only thing to let it move forward. The courage. Yeah. yeah. And you have to remember that Gorbachev began, in a fundamental sense, as still a Leninist. His Lenin was not the Lenin that, that, that is in our textbooks. But it was necessary to delete Stalin and what he had done. And that was, I mean, Gorbachev came to power as an anti-Stalinist to reform the Soviet Union, which was a system created by Stalin in the 30s, not primarily by Lenin, 
But what Gorbachev wanted to do, introduce markets and all the rest, he had to attack the monopolies and the fast state bureaucracies. This was the making of Stalin. So to get to to get where he wanted to go, he had to start out, and maybe it was actually the way, probably it was the way he actually believed, that Lenin was virtuous in his sense of the word. But at some moment, he realized, now that he fully understood his mission as he saw it, that he had to leave Lenin behind. To this day, if you ask him to talk about Lenin, he's, he doesn't denounce Lenin. He, he says the cliché, but it is a meaningful cliché that we all use. Lenin was a man of his times. I mean, how do we judge him by today? We judge him in the context of when he lived. It doesn't get you very far in that cliché, but there's enough truth in it for Gorbachev. But he needed Lenin uh, to, to delete Stalin, to undo, to de-Stalinize. That's what I wanted to say. He needed it politically, and I think intellectually and psychologically. And then, at some point, probably 1988, he didn't. And that's, of course, when the opposition really mounted. Thank you very much, Steve. Should we move on? Um, should we um, hear from Randy Bregman, Senior Counsel, Desmond Sullivan? Uh, is there anybody in the room that's thinking at all about a career in law? Maybe I should ask the question after I speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, I'm a lawyer, and I'm a lawyer that's worked most of my professional legal career either in Russia or with Russia on legal issues, legal commercial issues. Um, my uh, academic background, I did a master's degree uh, in what was then affectionately called Soviet studies at Yale University. Um, and I was an undergraduate at Columbia. I was a Russian language and literature major. Uh, but I didn't uh, uh, do much with Russia for a number of years. I was a school teacher in DC, not teaching Russian, teaching history. Um, and for various reasons, I got interested in law and went to law school at night, reasons having uh, nothing at the time to deal with the Soviet Union or Russia. Uh, but fortunately at that time, and when you talk about luck or fate, I'm not sure which it was, but perestroika started to happen while I was in law school. And there weren't very many people, either lawyers or, or people studying law, who had a background and interest in what was then still Soviet studies, it was the 80s. Um, and, uh, it, it, the world of law in connection to Russia changed dramatically. It was real business. And the Russians, uh, the Soviets, wrote a law called Joint Venture Law, um, which was the first time that foreign investment was allowed into Russia, really since the days of Lenin. Uh, and it provided a legal framework. It wasn't very long, and for various reasons of luck and chance, I happened to be on part of the committee that wrote the law, though I was still sort of a law student. Uh, but they were desperate, so I, I got to participate in it. And then um, in 1991, uh, the, one of my co-authors of the law worked at a law firm in Washington called Steptoe & Johnson, and they needed somebody to run their Moscow office. And uh, there weren't other competitors, so it was a very easy job interview. She was an old friend, and it's the only interview I ever had starting off with a, a two-sided kiss rather than shaking hands. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, we were off to, uh, to Moscow. Uh, but right before we left for Moscow, and this says something about uh, per perestroika and the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, we took a vacation in uh, Martha's Vineyard. And early one morning, the chairman of the law firm called up and said, well, how long do you think this will last? And I said, what is this? And he said, this is a coup against Gorbachev. And Gorbachev was forced out of M Moscow. So I, so I said, I don't know anything about it. I'll watch the TV and called him back later. And I said, uh, maybe six months. And he, he uh, said, yeah, that's what your partner Sarah said, six months. 
Uh, we're looking now at the force majeure clause of your contract to see what it means for your, I, I think he was joking, but uh, history made it irrelevant whether he was joking or not. My wife, who was watching the TV in the background, said one week. So one week was over, the, the coup attempt failed, and he called me up and he said, we are changing your contract, we're replacing you with your wife. <laughs> anyway, my wife was not a lawyer, so she couldn't run the office, but we moved to Moscow. Um, and in some ways, my Russian Soviet training was far more important in a way to the successes we had there than my legal training. Uh, in, this was, everything was new, brand new for Russia in a fundamental way. They had, the laws they had were all Soviet laws. The laws had to do with state planning, the state planned economy, not a market economy. There is no such thing but a, a contract between two private parties in the law. It, a contract in the Soviet Union was between the state and an individual and, and the company and was an order, it wasn't a contract. There was no private property. Well, here there were big hotel companies uh, leasing or investing in hotels, and there, were no, there was no law for to govern the ownership. And so there was this sort of vacuum, and the vacuum could only be filled at that time by Western law, by people who had a Western legal background, but also un had some understanding of the Russian context. So in some ways, I was exactly in the right place at exactly the right time. And as uh, the downside of the career advice I would give now is I think that opportunity is long, is gone. And I'll get to a, li a little later why I think there are other opportunities. Uh, but the cultural differences were, were very important because Russians were starting to do business, but to them, to most Russians, business was uh, a black market. And if you look at the history of the oligarchs, they were either from, had been in the black market before, or had been leaders of the Komsomol, which is sometimes hard to tell the difference. Um, but so they, they had to fill this vacuum and change this culture that was not just a Soviet culture, it was a Russian culture. There really wasn't a sense of private business even in the Tsarist period, much less a law that governed private business law. Most of the lawyers I interviewed to work in our office had an academic approach. And I, I hired some of them, and the first memos they wrote were to, for Western clients were filled with references to this law and that law and this scholar and that scholar. And I couldn't send them on to clients. They didn't answer their questions. So the first thing was to sort of change how lawyers uh, there looked at things until and while they were still developing the Russian law. But a lot of it was, was uh, filling gaps in the law. Um, another big part of the difference in business was uh, for Russians to engage with, in business with anybody, Russians or foreigners, they had to have a deep level of trust. You talked about drinking into the night after your event on Red Square. That's how, mm -hmm. they didn't have reports on, they didn't have reputations businesses. They had to get to know each other. And there were an awful lot of uh, joint ventures that were originally designed in saunas. Uh, I used to have a box filled with uh, American clients that would come to me with the terms of their agreement that were on napkins from the sauna and were sort of half dripping with water still. And we, they said, turn this into an agreement. Big challenge, right? But, but it was remarkable to me how many of the joint ventures started and had to start by that because people had no way of, of judging each other. The other, another cult, there are many, I could go on for days about the cultural differences, but one that came up a lot in our office was a kind of a Russian cultural sense of pessimism about business, and it would cause them to sort of hesitate. Americans tend to look at it sometimes, well, a lot of times by mistake, but sort of jump in with enthusiasm. I'm, I'm going to make a million dollars from this in three weeks. It's the greatest thing on earth. And I'm, um, uh, Bill Gates and I are connected some way, 
the cos cos cosmologically. <coughs> but Russians, it was sort of just the opposite. But we have to sort of mix the cultures. And um, the one, one example I have, we had a young man that rented a, an office, a, a young Russian, and he was dealing with Americans daily. But when, Ru when somebody from Russia would call him and ask him how he was, he would say, in Russian, talk Sibia, so-so. Uh, but 10 minutes later, somebody would call from the United States, ask him how he was. He would say, great, fine. And I s would say, Dima, how did you change so quickly in 10 minutes? He said, the most you can say in Russian is talk Sibia, because if you say anything more, it's bad luck. <laughs> and something's wrong someplace that you may not know about. So you, you have to, the fake you were talking about. Um, but it came up more and when people would come to us with deals. And the Russian lawyer, I uh, had one outstanding Russian lawyer who, after the clients would describe the deal, she would always say, that you can't do this deal. It's not possible under Russian law. But soon I learned to tell by the way she said Nievaz Moshna how long it would take for her to find a solution to the problem. And she always did. But the initial reaction is sort of the opposite of the American optimism, where it's a very often over-enthusiastic uh, over uh, approach. Um, the, the, there was this challenge, though, of constantly trying to find Russian law where it didn't exist and where it was just it was coming out in uh, primitive forms or unsophisticated forms. It was being written by Soviet legal scholars who really didn't know much about how commercial deals worked. Um, and, and the good side of that is that we could very much influence how the laws were interpreted. There was no other interpretation. And when we had a deal that was something new, uh, we, we had to fill, up, fill in the blanks and sometimes even just make it up because there, there was no Russian law. There was, we had a, one of the big issues of the time was currency exchange. How do, you, how do you get paid in rubles and transfer it to dollars? And one day, a club, one of our big clients called an oil company, and they had all these rubles, and they couldn't get them into hard currency of any kind. So we found the one uh, presidential decree about hard currency, and it, 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 they were right. They couldn't change it. But if you move the comma in the degree four or five words later, it read favorably and made it possible. And I said, but you can't move the comma. And the Russian lawyer said, I'll show you how you can do that. She, she was a professor at Moscow State University, and she called up Yeltsin's legal advisor. You may have known him, Sergei Shakhran. He was a young man at the time, but he was the main legal advisor to Yeltsin. It turned out it was a former student of hers. So she called up and she said, hello, Seryozha. This is Tatyana Konstantina, but no, so asserting her authority, and said, I've been reading this decree you wrote, and the comma is in the wrong place. <laughs> and he said, um, please forgive me, Professor, Constant uh, Professor Kovilova. I, I was, I'm doing all these decrees late at night, and I have no time to sleep and no time to think of them. Uh, I'm very pleased that you're noticing this mistake. The next morning, in Rosiskaya Gazeta, the decree was reissued with the comma in the right place. But that's what it was like. And it, it's probably not, if I talk about it too much in front of lawyers, I could be sued for malpractice. <laughs> but, and and, and the, the Russians didn't have any malpractice law. Um, but things changed. And some for the good, some for the bad. But Russia developed the market economy. Russian lawyers learned how to practice practical law, how to advise clients. A lot of them studied in the West, worked for law firms in the West and moved back. The Russians did develop a set of laws with some, some, still some major weaknesses, but at least a comprehensive picture of law. And the role of foreigners, in, my, in this case, in my case, particularly Americans, changed rather dramatically. I was, when I was there, the foreigners were sort of the, lead, the leaders of the legal community. Now, of course, it's most law firms and law offices are Russian lawyers. Uh, with 
a handful of Western lawyers. But it doesn't mean there aren't careers there, and there are, it doesn't mean there aren't uh, opportunities and special opportunities to use the training you get in, in Russian studies. Um, there, one of the big issues, and this is a subject I could also talk for several days on, is, is corruption and the role that Western lawyers play in helping to design transactions that don't violate uh, corruption laws, either wet, Russian or, or Western corruption laws. Also, there still is tremendous weakness, both on the business side and on the legal side, in, 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 uh, in the finance and banking area. And there are a number of Russian uh, American lawyers with Russian backgrounds who work exactly in these areas still in Russia and have made lives there. And I think that will continue, that most law firms will continue to need uh, Western lawyers, uh, maybe as a, min a, a small minority, but an important part of the office. And I notice even Russian-Russian law firms, my firm was a, a wet American firm with an office there, Russian law firms uh, are hiring Westerners, including Americans, and again, to pl play specialized roles, but important roles. And so I do think there are uh, career opportunities there, and very interesting ones where I think you need to have a background in Russian studies in order to not just do well, but to enjoy it, to enjoy this mixture of very, very different legal and commercial and business cultures. Thank you so much. One of the graduates of this of, of NYU, and I think she majored in Russian studies, Jane Vets, S A T T S, later went to Harvard Law School and then to Moscow for Clinton. They have Clinton has an office there. Stayed there three years. And now she's back in the United States. But uh, if any of you want to hear the experience of a young woman who went right from here to law school in Moscow and back, uh, she's around and she's very, very interesting. And had a baby along the way. She <coughs> kept her family life going. There, there's also uh, a Did you know Jane? No, no, but there's a woman at NYU Law School, Mary Holland, who oh. was in Moscow when I was there. And some, some, some of you may meet her and she. She lived there and worked there at more or less the same time I do. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jeremy? Sure. Um, so I should say it's an honor to be up here because I, unlike I assume the rest of the panel, I was born into a world without the Soviet Union. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I had kind of a different path on my way to kind of Russian studies, and also I focus on arms control uh, and nuclear nonproliferation. Um, and I'm also obviously at a different stage in my career, so hopefully that can be helpful to some. Um, so I think my initial kind of introduction to Russian was in high, in high school. Um, I was actually up on 84th Street and had a senior elective on the history of the Cold War. And it was with a colonel from West Point, a former colonel from West Point, but also a historian. Um, so he really made us put our Cold Warrior hats on. And it wasn't Bill Owen. Oh, no, it was uh, Gary Fisher. Um, and it was my first exposure to not just really Russia, um, but also nuclear weapons and kind of more scholarly analysis. Um, and since that point, I had always been interested in diplomacy. We read um, George Kennan's Long Telegram, um, which is an example of uh, kind of policy that can be made when you have a deeper understanding of a country, whereas in a lot of policy making now, it comes straight from the top, not from regional area experts. Um, and it leads to much poorer outcomes, as we've seen. Um, so when I decided, to, when I entered my undergrad in 2013 at Davidson, I actually chose to study Arabic because in 2013, you know, Russia didn't seem as important, um, which was obviously not true. But um, and then Crimea happened, and suddenly my kind of interest was rekindled. Um, so after graduating from Davidson Political Science, I kind of um, 
kept my focus on nuclear nonproliferation and discovered the current program I'm on, which is a dual MA degree between the Middlebury Institute in Monterey, um, which has a strong um, graduate initiative in Russian studies that I'll talk about a little, um, and also at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. Um, and I think one of the major things to avoid in um, kind of international relations and policy making uh, is avoiding mirror imaging, which is kind of just assuming um, that if someone takes an action, they're doing it for the reasons you would do it. Like, you know, we say like, oh, put yourself in someone else's shoes, but so often people just imagine they're wearing their shoes and think the exact same way you would think. Um, so a huge uh, kind of benefit to kind of my uh, study of Russian um, and Russia was the Graduate Initiative in Russian Studies, um, and it's directed by Anna Vasilyeva. And uh, one of her major programs is the Summer Symposium in Russian Studies in Monterey, California. And so she brings top level experts from not just the US, um, like I think she had Tom Graham and Ambassador John Taft, um, but also Russian experts like Dmitry Trenin um, and Lev Gudkov, um, which if you're studying without any link, with any foreign language basis, you are only introduced to English language um, publications, obviously. And there are some Western academics who can kind of get their points across correctly, but especially in mass media, even reputable media, um, you really get a skewed picture. Um, for example, one of the things uh, that the Graduate Initiative in Russian Studies does is translate Levada Center polls, which is a uh, polling center in Moscow. It's one of the only independent um, kind of sociological institutes there. And it gives a much kind of clear picture to like what Russians are thinking on politics. Um, because if you read the New York Times or if you read the New York Times like, you know, two or three years ago, you may have been under the impression that like Alex Navalny had kind of a widespread base of support, which he had, you know, some following. But if you read it through a Western kind of liberal media, um, and I don't mean that pejoratively, I just mean kind of like a classically liberal outlook, um, you know, it was a little biased in that it kind of inflated that. When if you looked at the polling, even at the height, he was polling at like three or four percent. So clearly, we're not understanding something about Russia. Um, and that kind of brings me back to, I guess, arms control. Um, so now currently I'm advising the Holy See um, on arms control at the UN, and this is leading up to the 2020 review conference um, for the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is kind of the basis of the international order for nuclear weapons, um, but also for the general world order because uh, nuclear weapons are so important. Um, and if you're not aware, Russia and the US still combined between the two of them uh, have over 12,000 weapons, even 30 years after the Cold War. Um, and relations in the nuclear space since 2014 have never been worse since at least the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, kind of from the 70s onward, there were definitely tensions and there were definitely disagreements, but at least in the multilateral setting where other countries were involved, the US and the Soviet Union always kind of put aside their differences in other areas and usually could at least show the world that they were united kind of in this area. And that was mostly to uh, placate the countries that wanted them to disarm. Um, but now we're going to enter this conference in a month, and there is uh, there was a Security Council meeting yesterday that I was at, and Russia just had a litany of complaints about the United States. The United States doesn't respond to any of them, and then subtly criticizes Russia for other things. Um, and I, I'm not going to blame either side. There are many scholarly debates, many journalistic debates, um, but clearly there's just such a misunderstanding culturally. Um, and you know we're going to have policy differences. We're going to have differences in geopolitical interests. But when you add cultural misunderstanding to that, it can uh, result in miscalculation and misinterpretation. Um, and in the field of uh, nuclear nonproliferation, the stakes for that uh, <coughs> can't be higher. Um, so. So having Russian in the field is very important because the U.S.-Russia relationship is still the most important in the field of arms control. Um, you know, the Trump administration talks about bringing China in, but we're not anywhere near bringing China into any sorts of trilateral arms control agreements. Um, and 
Another thing I wanted to add, kind of as a younger person, you know, uh, in the 80s, there was a ton of people studying um, Soviet studies. Um, when the Cold War ended, some people stayed in the fields, like the people up here, but many other people who are graduating from college left the field. And then there's a, there has been a shortage now that there's more demand um, in government and uh, in other areas. Uh, so being a young person in international relations with Russian is important because there's always a shortage with the government. Um, and I've had the opportunity to benefit from the Critical Language Scholarship um, and the Presidential Management Fellowship programs. Um, so if people have questions about those, I can kind of speak to that later. Um, and I think that covers what I wanted to say. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, sorry. No, I just want to add one thing. If government work isn't for you, this kind of goes off Randy's point. Um, if there's one area that you can, you know, it's debatable how you can credit any president with job creation. But President Obama and President Trump have created a lot of compliance jobs with the amount of sanctions that are used. Because, um, you know, if Congress doesn't know how to solve something or doesn't want to do it, they have to solve something. They put sanctions on it. Um, so compliance jobs are expanding like crazy uh, at banks, consulting firms. Um, so it's probably less exciting work than other areas, but it's definitely paid better. So something to consider. You can't lose, is what you're saying. Um, I have an equally convoluted uh, relationship with Russia, is some of the ones you've heard here. <coughs> I was around for the Soviet Union. Um, I first became aware of uh, Russia during Cuban Missile Crisis. I was growing up in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. And on our TVs, they flashed. Um, sailors are all ordered to return to their ships. Uh, that had never happened before. Um, North Florida kind of freaked out over that. South Florida was freaking out over Russian missiles that were being put in Cuba. North Florida was freaking out. How did the ships have to leave so quickly? And is this war is imminent? So we went down to the beach and you could see all of our warships literally lined up along the coast headed south. And they left without all the sailors. So not only did they never asked for the sailors to come, it was even worse they had all these sailors on the dock waving at the ship. Um, they ferried them down by planes and helicopters um, to get to the ships later. But, but I bring it up for a purpose. Um, I, my, I was raised by a single mother. She takes me off to Italy. Um, Italy was wonderful. Anybody wants to do Italian studies, I could talk to you about that too. Um, but when I returned to the United States, I spoke Italian and you had to take a foreign language in Florida and all my school offered was Spanish, French, and on an experimental basis, Russian. And I thought Spanish and French will destroy the Italian. So I did Russian. Um, fell in love with, and you're hearing this, I think, from everyone, sort of the culture and the language and the history. And, and, it, and it, I brought up the Cuban Missile Crisis part, because there's always this challenge with Russia. And, and, and Professor Cohen brought that up. There's a negative and a positive side with Russia in the United States that's always there. Um, so I'm learning Russian language, and I was fascinated by Lermontov and Solzhenitsyn. Andrei Mallory came up with this. Well, the Soviet Union survived till 1984, off by five years, better <laughs> than the CIA. You know, you know, reading these things, getting into this, but also being taught. Florida had a required course, Americanism versus Communism. Every high school student had to take to get a degree. The, these are bad people. So they're fascinating people, they're bad people. But I kind of got hooked on the language. Um, I ended up going to the University of Florida studying Russians, also studying broadly international affairs. Couldn't make up my mind which one I liked best. So I applied to Georgetown to work toward an academic career um, teaching Russian language and literature. And I applied to Notre Dame to look at a career in international affairs. And I did what Bob Woodward would say, follow the money. I'll let them sort out which one wins. And uh, due to a unique circumstance, Condoleezza Rice wasn't happy 
at Notre Dame, so she left and wasn't going to pursue her doctorate there. Notre Dame offered me that money, and I went to Notre Dame and became uh, more focused on international affairs. But I bring that up too because I've had a career Russia related, an academic one, a foreign service one, and a civil society one. So you could use this language and this background in a wide variety of ways uh, very effectively. But part of why I could do that and why it was successful goes back again to something uh, Professor Cohen said, is it was more a vocation than a passing interest. If I'd only just thought these Russian books are kind of interesting, who would think about killing the landlady? You know, you could have had that, but, but that wasn't enough. You sort of start getting into it, and I got into it in a broad way. Um, I won't detail my careers, because I've got three. It takes a long time, but uh, I ended up being a peace mediator for the United States. I opened the embassy, American embassy in Georgia, when the Soviet Union collapsed. I was in Moscow as the Soviet Union was collapsing, was teaching Soviet legislatures, legislators, how to do oversight of the intelligence services in the military, which may be not a uh, popular figure at the Kremlin among those groups, but because of the democracy Gorbachev had brought in, parliamentarians would escort me in, and the KGB would scowl, and I would spend all day, sort of, here's how we do it in the United States, here's how you can do it too. Um, it became a very interesting career on that uh, government side, and, and a very rewarding one, and then I returned afterwards to academia, and my focus actually nuclear weapons and diplomacy. I was a diplomat for the United States, and I worked on arms control treaties and did that. Now I work on peace efforts, also in civil society organizations, primarily in the former Soviet Union. So the language, the background, has been very useful in all three. Um, to focus on careers specifically, I think you've already heard today, in many ways Russia is back, but it's back the negative way. The United States is very concerned about what are Russians thinking and going to do, how are they going to do it, um, that's the United States writ large, the government, and our society, and our business community. There aren't a lot of people who are able to give them those answers. The very top of our government right now, they don't want that advice, so you don't have to worry about that. Below it, they do. And there's a real hunger for why, why aren't these things working the way they should. So if you're interested in public policy and have these Russian credentials, I think you'll find there's a lot of doors. Um, many of them people think of immediately. Foreign Service is one. The intelligence community is another one. Um, broad law enforcement, often you don't think about. We've got a lot of Russian criminal activity in the United States now. FBI is desperate for people who speak Russian, have some understanding of Russians. Um, Homeland Security, the same. Uh, from a negative side, in a way, you know, if you love Russia, Maybe it's not the place you want to go. Um, maybe if you love Russia, even the Foreign Service <coughs> isn't the place you want to go. But if you understand Russia, there are potential careers in all of these. If you totally want to do nothing but good things, um, there is a demand for more people with Russian language skills and an understanding of Russia in the NGO community writ large. Um, right now we're recruiting for people to work in London who are focused on the Caucasus. Uh, another NGO I was involved with is recruiting also a job in London, uh, people who understand Central Asia, but understand Central Asia with that Russian overlay of how on earth does Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and the Turkmenistan orient themselves to be Moscow to be able to do other things with the West. So lots of jobs have popped up in those kind of sectors. And if, if you're broad thinking, I think you could find a lot of places to work that can be very rewarding. Um, I didn't mention much about academia. I go to it last on purpose. Um, I love it. It's the best time career one could ever have. Um, summers, you get to do your own research, structure your time as you want. 
a serious break in the winter. Um, it's less promising right now to be an academic than probably at any time in the history of the United States. Um, so if you're thinking of this as a vocation, like almost religious, then I would say, sure, think about academia too. Um, if all you can imagine doing with your life is studying Russian literature or teaching Russian politics, go for it. I get to do that. I love it. Um, but the reality in academia now is there aren't many jobs, they're getting fewer. There aren't many tenure track jobs, you're disappearing at every type of institution. Um, and the promise of finding work that pays well enough and is satisfactory enough, I think is getting more and more difficult. Doesn't mean you can't do it. You have professors <laughs> here who've done it. I've done it, you know, so there are slots there, but, but it is more difficult. And I think you have to have the commitment to understand it comes with some of those other impediments. Um, government will not make you very wealthy. Uh, being a lawyer might, depends on <laughs> the contracts you're doing, but government actually pays you reasonably well. And government gives you, and you heard a bit of this from Professor Cohen, an access to um, levels of the societies you're dealing with that are uncommon, and you can get very hooked on that. That uh, you know, he talked about, well, he, he met the president of my job as a Foreign Service officer, you met all the presidents. I had a ridiculous number of senators and congressmen who, when they would come to Moscow, you brief them. They all know who you are. Um, and on the Russia side, you know all those Russian political and cultural figures, too. So those jobs come with maybe less monetary reward, but a lot of other uh, psychic reward. Plus, the sense you're doing good things for your country, or good things for the planet that you're working on. So, why don't I stop with five Thank you so much. ten minutes? So, I'm uh, quite different from everybody on this panel in a way that I, as you could probably hear, was not born in this country, and uh, Russian is uh, my native language. Uh, so, I came here from Odessa, Ukraine, at the age of 17. And uh, I uh, uh, got a degree in political science and then a few years later in uh, master's in international affairs. And, uh, but they did not uh, particularly work in a Russian field. They worked as an ESL teacher actually for quite a few years. Um, I worked for the CUNY system for about 14 years at uh, a uh, community college and I uh, worked at a private school. And, uh, at a certain point, I lost one of my jobs, and uh, it just uh, somehow this opportunity presented itself to to translate and to interpret. So I actually do both. Uh, so interpreting is uh, uh, oral, and transla uh, translating is written. Many people confuse <laughs> those two. And uh, as interpreting, I do actually mostly in the legal field, in uh, for. Uh, uh, court system. I actually do Russian and Ukrainian. Although well, Russian is my native language, but I speak some Ukrainian as well. I mean, pretty fluent Ukrainian, but never could imagine that I would be also working on it here. But there is a community that needs it to, to an extent. But mostly it's Russian, and I, uh, so I, uh, for the last uh, year and a half, I've worked uh, actually full time as an interpreter for uh, for the court system. Before that, I worked as a regime interpreter, a freelance interpreter, and still do that sometimes. And it's, a, it's an interesting uh, uh, field. Uh, I mean, you learn something in terms of uh, uh, laws and uh, how the system works, but also you learn uh, you know, about, about people. And uh, you see their personalities. And uh, I you know, have so many you know, funny stories and interesting stories and uh, tragic stories that, you know, uh, that uh, I encountered uh, while uh, while interpreting in the court system or uh, outside of the court system and other legal settings like depositions, <coughs> I also interpreted uh, for a lot. And uh, somebody suggested that I could even write a book about it. I haven't started doing it yet, but I've you know written a few short kind of stories about. Uh, I mean, mostly uh, like amusing ones and. Uh, certain funny episodes that happened. 
so that's one uh, thing that I've been doing. Uh, the other is uh, translations, so uh, written translations. Uh, so I do, I, uh, for about eight years already, I've, uh, I collaborate with Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, so they have a center in Moscow, so I work with, the, uh, with them. Um, and uh, it's, it was a, quite an interesting uh, you know, path uh, for me as well. So I've uh, happened to learn a lot um, uh, about the areas that I've never uh, you know, heard about before. Uh, but, uh, so basically, the first few years I worked for them, it was a more of a serious kind of inter uh, translation of like, academic papers. There was a lot of actually on nuclear uh, you know, arms, uh, non-proliferation, non and things like that. Um, but then uh, they started, uh, like, uh, they've taken a more journalistic approach, actually, to what they write, and they've, uh, they have a, um, a website, uh, so, uh, which uh, publishes, you know, mostly journalists write about different uh, um, articles related to to what's happening in the former Soviet Union, actually all over the world, uh, uh, most, most, mostly Russia. Uh, so um, uh, I uh, also worked on a few books uh, uh, that uh, were written by the experts uh, uh, that write for Carnegie. Well, the first one uh, was um, actually a, a bunch of articles put in, into a book uh, called Russia 2025, something like that, projections over the Russian future, and um, different experts just voiced their opinions on what's going to happen to Russia um, in years to come. Uh, then I worked on, uh, with uh, Sergei Alexashenko, you might have heard of him, he was uh, He's an economist and uh, worked in the Russian Central Bank under Yeltsin, and um, he wrote a book called The Putin Counter Revolution. So I translated some chapters from from that one. Um, it's interesting that uh, what he describes basically in, he takes every area of uh, you know uh, uh, judicial, uh, legislative, media, business, and uh, and he writes how basically what the, the uh, little accomplishments, or maybe greater accomplishments, that have been made uh, since the perestroika and under the first years, uh, years of Yeltsin, how they were subverted basically under under Putin uh, and, uh, during Putin's uh, regime. Um, and um, uh, recently, also, uh, so these were uh, just some articles that uh, uh, some chapters or articles that I translated that were put in the book. But uh, recently, I worked on quite a big project actually, translated the book cover to cover. It's about uh, it's written by a journalist Andrei Kolesnikov uh, called <laughs> "Opet Svobodnej Zhizni," which uh, I translated as uh, "Learning to Live Free," uh, and uh, it hasn't come out yet. That book. Um, hopefully it, uh, it will soon. And uh, basically he, uh, he writes about um, uh, the Moscow School for uh, Civic Education, uh, which used to be called Moscow School of Political Studies. Uh, uh, they changed the name when they got onto the list of uh, the foreign agents. Uh, as you know, Russia passed uh, this law. Um, uh, making uh, the organizations that receive funding from abroad register as foreign agents. So they um, put the school on the list, which was kind of an offense to, to its uh, founders. Um, and the book is quite interesting. It's like a biography of these two people, uh, Yuri Sinakosov and Lena Nimirovska, the ones who uh, created the school, and it has it kind of is interspersed with the flashbacks into Russian history, basically from like post-war, you know, they're still under Stalin, and then goes into Khrushchev, the uh, so, uh, uh, then the Brezhnev era, then the Gorbachev, and uh, probably a bit of Yeltsin and Putin, 
So, I mean, uh, it's interesting when you read about people's lives and also you find out about the events that uh, happen during, uh, during those times. Um, so, um, and right now they offered uh, to me a book, uh, to translate a book, uh, which uh, is more of a philosophical nature written by uh, one of the founders of the school, Yuri Sinakosov, and that's what I'm going to be working right now, and it's probably the most challenging one that I've had so far, uh, because it's just so abstract and kind of philosophical in nature, and that's harder uh, to translate, and lots of allusions, lots of, uh, you know, citations, so like, I started translating a chapter, for example, it had a lot of Shakespeare in it, yeah. and it's kind of like, a, uh, I mean, it's in a way easy because you just, you don't have to translate. Obviously, it doesn't make sense to translate uh, Shakespeare from Russian back into English. So you just find, uh, you, look for the, you look for the quotes. Uh, and sometimes it's not so, so easy because the translations are very often are very different, especially of Shakespeare, of what, uh, uh, you know, how Shakespeare uh, put it. And um, at this particular point today, Recent days, I've been translating an interesting article uh, written actually by a Carnegie scholar. Uh, uh, her name is uh, Tatiana Stanovaya, and she writes about uh, the five elites in uh, in modern Russia, uh, basically kind of debunking the myth that Putin's friends are uh, are very influential or the the uh, uh, the uh, Siloviki, so-called Siloviki, or in English, if I say, pronounce it Siloviki, the, the four structures, the security apparatus of, uh, uh, of, of government that they're actually running the show. So she, what she uh, is writing, that it's more of a technocratic elite right now, that it's more uh, of those uh, just uh, kind of implementers of, of the policy, of government policies that, uh, that are basically in charge, and maybe it's some one of them will will replace Putin, so, um, so you know, it's, in, it's an interesting, uh, to, to make it more general, it's an interesting field, I don't know how, like, whether it, it could be a career, uh, exactly, but, but it is um, something that you could do while uh, doing something else, and um, so that's basically my my suggestion uh, to, you know, you're learning Russian, so you might as well, you know, uh, figure out how to, uh, how to use it in, in, this, in this field. It's, uh, I think it's pretty rewarding and enriching, so here I am. And I'm the last dancer, Sandy Collett. I'm the last man standing. <laughs> There's many, many hands, I understand. Uh, I cannot uh, help you on how Russian studies inform my life. I never studied Russian. I never was in a Russian studies class. Although I did live, live 10 years, 11 years in Siberia. I speak Russian basically. I can get by with a cab driver. With my father-in-law, I know how to ask for more vodka. <laughs> And as they were saying, you know, vodka is something you really need to understand if you're going to be in Russia. What I can talk to you about is what Russia is like and how to, how you, if you want to live there and if you want to do something in Russia, there's plenty to do for an American. My background is in the history of religions, history and philosophy of religion. University of Virginia, before that University of Chicago. Uh, I was a an academic for about 10 years, then I went into management consulting. I was a partner at Ernst & Young, a principal at Computer Sciences Corporation, vice president of General Electric, and president of Alliance One Healthcare. Uh, I was fortunate uh, when I was 49 to meet a lovely young Russian woman who I met and married, and she wanted to stay close to home, which was in Barnaul, is the Altai Krai region, of Russia, four hours and a half by flight from Moscow due east on the Mongolian, Chinese, Kazakhstan border. Okay. I've spent some time in Mongolia, some in Kazakhstan, never in China. 
There's too much going on there right now. Um, when I got to Barnau, uh, this was you know 15 years ago now. Um, it still was very much Soviet-like. I mean, Barnell is the least developed, poorest area in the Federation. Uh, and, you know, if you wanted to get a cup of coffee in the morning, you couldn't get a cup of coffee in the morning. There was no restaurants open until noon. And then it was a packet of Nescafe in the hot water. Now there are gourmet coffee places open 24 hours all over the city of Barnell, which is a city of 600,000 people. Not far from Nova Sibirsk, which is twice its size, 1.2 million people. Um, so I wound up in Russia, I wound up in Siberia, and what I really, uh, the first thing I did, because I, I had been an academic, is I went to the pedagogical university where they had a linguistic institute which was teaching English and German and French and other languages. And I, um, I introduced myself to the rector of the linguistic institute. I was the only American in Barnell. Come, come, come in. And uh, they made me a professor and I taught. Uh, I didn't teach English, I taught philosophy and cultural studies, intercultural studies, to Russian students whose English was almost as good as mine. Yeah. Um, one thing led to the other. I, I mean, I wound up doing a number of things in Russia. I'm also an author. I started writing my first novel there. I've written two novels now, both about Russia. The third one is underway. It's, it'll be a trilogy. Um, but I was writing political and social commentary as well. And uh, I did a number of books while I was out there. But one of the things I did early on, while I was at the university, um, is that I get introduced to another gentleman whose English was very, very good, a young man, younger than myself. I look young, I'm 67 now. Um, and Alexei uh, had an idea. There, the, uh, Putin had just put in a rule they wanted to develop the Altai region as a tourist region, which they should, because it's an absolutely gorgeous area of the country, just stunning. And so Alexei and I decided that nobody understood anything about customer service in the tourism business. So we started a consulting company in Barnau on uh, customer service in tourism. And we did a couple of projects. But one of the guys in the group, you know, I had to get guys who, you know, I had to get native speakers. You know, I sort of coordinated stuff, but they were really, you know, delivering the material. One of them threatened me because he didn't do his job and he, I didn't want to pay him. And he threatened me and uh, I said, well, you bring your guys from the mafia and I'll bring my guys from uh, the, uh, f the fire brigade. What is that? Um, <laughs> not the FSB. Anyway, um, so I, I learned very quickly that you had to be a little careful in Russia, in dealing with the Russians. But that all worked out fine. Here I am, I'm alive. And I've done several interviews with FSB, as a matter of fact, because I'm the only American in Altai. And they're always asking me for favors. So I don't know if I'm a double agent or not. Um, so I developed a small consultancy there. We did some business. I stayed involved with the university. I set up an international exchange program between uh, the Pedagogical University at Altai and Hobart and William Smith College, where I, my alma mater for my bachelor's degree up in Geneva, New York. And so we have students going back and forth uh, on their own money, their own dime. And tuition's wiped out, so there's no tuition fee either side. The Americans, the Russians get a lot better deal because the Russian Americans like 20 times as high as it is in Russia. Um, but the thing is that, uh, you know, you can just pick up, especially if you're speaking a little Russian. Anybody here speaking a little Russian? Okay. You can just pick up, get up, fly to Moscow, wait a couple of hours, get on a flight to Barnell, go and introduce yourself. There's lots of things to, to do there. there, especially if you go to, go to a university. 
Go to, uh, you don't have to, there's, there, there's pedagogical universities, there must be 20 of them in the Altai region. There's one in Bisk, in Velokurica, in Novosibirsk, in, in, in uh, Barnal, there's others that I don't know about. So you can, and there's lots of English teaching jobs, not simply at the pedagogical universities, but there's lots of independent little companies that have sprung up all over the city. There must be 40 English teaching companies in the city of Barnell, 600,000 people. And of course, I did a lot of, you know, guest lecturing there, did a lot of guest lecturing at every university in Altai Krai and elsewhere. I did a lot of presentations in Moscow when the book was released, we had it translated into Russian. I, one of my former students was in Moscow and I had him come, because my Russian is horrible. Um, I, so, you know, I did a number of presentations at different bookstores in Moscow. I did interviews with gazettes and on TV and newspaper and radio. Um, there's a lot for an American to do in Russia. And you don't have to, you know, I spoke no Russian at all. Of course, I had a wife there who could help me a lot at first until I learned to get by on my own. But you can all get by on your own much, much more easily than I did. Um, there's no reason not to get on a plane, go to Novosibirsk, go to Barnal, go to Bisk, go to Belokurica, go to Kemerova. Um, that's another city I spent time in. Uh, so there's, there's lots to do. And you don't, you don't have to pursue a career here in Russia. You can pursue a career there in Russia. And there's lots of opportunities, as everybody's been pointing out. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. That's it. To open the floor to questions, we can um, ask specific speakers or general questions to everyone. Hi, I'm Lady. I'm the administrator of the Russian Council. Um, I do have an interesting question for the students. Is here we, um, you know, talk about learning Russia to understand Russian. You know, are Russians learning English or America mm -hmm. to understand American? I, I wonder like, if any, anybody could speak to this, like, From, what is the difference? First of all, I, I want to say that there's a complete misunderstanding of how the Russians in the heart of the country feel, even in Moscow, but specifically in the heart of Siberia. They absolutely love Americans, categorically, without a doubt, they love Americans. They love to hear English, they love to try and speak English. They, I brought a number of Russians on different grants across to the U.S., I'm sure you have a variety of stories. Right? I'd say it's not exactly to learn about America. They have an appreciation for American culture, so mm -hmm. they want to understand the words to the songs they sing. <laughs> they sing them and they often don't know what they mean. They want to understand the movie and not rely on subtitles. Mm -hmm. To them, those are their movies too. They're their songs too. So they learn for that, and a lot learn for business. It's understood, Russian won't get you far enough in the world yeah. if you don't pick up another language, and the language in contrast to the turn of the century before the last, when everybody learned French, now it's English. And now and they're turning away, and they're turning towards China. A lot of them are studying Chinese. Where you're at, yeah. They're all studying Chinese now. Yeah. But, but there's that. I mean, there's a deep curiosity about the United States that's been there all the time. And then the Soviet Union period really uninformed. People would stop you and ask, just amazing, do all Americans have helicopters? <laughs> is that how you get to work? You know, is, is it true that you go in the stores, they're all full of goods, yes, and you don't pay for them? No, <laughs> but the assumption was this was the place on the planet to live. We had everything. And, they would hear one thing, not trust it, interpret it in a different way. Now they have a better understanding of what's here. I'm sadly also a mistaken one in many ways in the government there helps keep it mistaken. That we're just as corrupt as you know, our oligarchs are like their oligarchs. And Jeff Bezos is just like the guy who stole the steel factory in Magnitogorsk, but he's not. He's quite different. Yeah. 
Actually, Jeremy, what is it? Yeah, I don't, this isn't a representative sample, definitely, but I live with two Russians now in Hell's Kitchen um, who are both on, in my MA program. Uh, one's from Moscow, one's from Yekaterinburg. And I can hear them saying, why would you ever go to Bernal? <laughs> I know, I believe oh, you, yeah. I, but it's like if someone says go to yeah. South Dakota, it's really beautiful. Yeah, no, no it, it is, is beautiful. It is beautiful. Barnell's a great little see. city, and Altai is a gorgeous area. Mm -hmm. But one of my roommates, um, his girlfriend, who is visiting here, uh, Nastia, she, uh, I think she just got her master's in American studies, actually. So she was studying not just English, to learn English, but uh, to study the U.S. and our political system and how it works. I think she's very interested in um, gerrymandering and how <laughs> think tanks influence the political system. And I still remember when I first met her in Monterey. She asked, uh, she said, oh, "Who's your favorite senator?" Um, and she meant it as like a political operator, not necessarily for political views. And she was just like, "Mine's John Thune." And I would just, I was like, I have heard his name. I think he's one of the Dakotas. But like, I was like, wow, she knows like our political system better than we do. Um, and I think definitely in the US we have a shortage of knowledge on the Russian domestic political system because I don't know much about the Russian domestic political system and uh, it's definitely needed. Can I tell me to that? Um, it's one of the most important changes from Russia to the Soviet Union was the, and started in Perestroika, was people being able to travel outside the Soviet Union. And uh, it's just, it's remarkable how many, particularly young people, have traveled abroad and watch Western news, can get Western news. When, I, it, when we were there in the 80s, you had to go to Helsinki to get the Herald Tribune, uh, and you couldn't get baseball scores, which was very important to me. But after the fall of the Soviet Union, you could get baseball uh, scores. But it, it, it made a big difference because before they got what you were describing, sort of wrote stories about who were good Americans, who were bad, what was true, what was not. Now they can go and see for themselves, and they don't even have to travel. During 9-11, I was in an office in Washington, D.C., between the Capitol and the White House. And we weren't allowed to leave our office. And on and off, our systems, uh, computer system went down. How did I find out what was going on in Washington during 9-11 was my colleagues in Moscow would, were watching CNN and would call me up and say, oh, we saw that there was a rumor of a bomb there. Are you OK? And we talked every 15 minutes where I couldn't get the news from here. So that it, it, it's just a, cha a huge change. And I think you'll find more and more mm -hmm. people as time goes by mm -hmm. who have a, an accurate uh, understanding of the West and study it. I would just say, like, in terms of learning English, you know, when I grew up there, you know, we uh, spoke very rudimentary English, the way it was taught in schools. It was uh, really, you had to do it on your own somehow by listening to music. You couldn't really learn it, you know, wh while you were in school, because basically the way you learned it uh, was uh, you had to, like, the sentence that everybody says is like, London is the capital of Great Britain. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Like, well, you know, that was uh, the extent <laughs> of it. That was the extent of it. But uh, nowadays, I mean, generally, uh, if people don't even make an effort to learn English or to learn about America, it's the, the way this, this, the world is, mm -hmm. they, they learn about it. And just, I was myself surprised how, my, how many English words uh, you know, are used in, on a daily basis because here we're trying to, you know, the Russian immigrants trying to like uh, maintain pure Russian, not the, I mean, those who, who do try, <laughs> but uh, you know, not to use uh, words like appointment or a traffic or something like that. But, but you go there and they use those words, <laughs> those very same words that we're trying to avoid. So, yeah, can, can I tell one quick anecdote about uh, that one of the lawyers in our office and I had an argument one day because he insisted that the word blue chips about in casinos, blue chips comes from the Russian word blue chipsky, and I said, "How it's blue? That's an American an English word, and chip. That's an." He said, "No, it, it, it came into English through blue chipsky because the first casinos that used chips were in Moscow in the early 19th century." 
So that's a way of English words, well, from his point of view, Russian words have come into English. Did you have another question? Oh, um, this is for Mandy. Um, did you notice a moment, like professionally or for the firm, when the business climate changed? A specific moment? I, I'm not sure. If, if I, I'd have to think about that for my first reaction was it was sort of always changing because it, it started from this sort of extreme the pulling down of the Soviet flag, the raising of the Russian flag, and suddenly it was a market economy. I mean, um, it changed in a negative. You mean more recently? Right, right. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a simple process. Part of uh, the, bad, the bad political, the worsening political relationship um, hasn't affected a lot of businesses so much. I'll get to the sanctions in a second because that is a big difference. But uh, for the most part, businesses had already kind of figured out when the situation started getting worse, they had already sort of situated themselves there and found ways to continue and found it, for the most part, a profitable market. So they continued even as the political relations got worse. The sanctions have created a big difference because they affect who you can do business with, their direct impact. And the Russians, of course, are not particularly happy about the sanctions, not just because of the United States, the rest of, much of the rest of the Western world. But it, it's an interesting change because initially people went in there American businesses went in there thinking uh, it, it's the Wild West, we'll try it, we'll explore, it. maybe we'll hit, hit a rich, maybe we won't. And then they built factories and they were invested there and they were taking out product and shipping in product. And they, those companies more or less continue to do it, uh, except those that are directly involved with the sanctions. So I'm not sure there's a, a moment and I'm not sure it's dramatically changed for the worse. It, it's not like it was when I lived there, which was everybody was all excited about and they came in with the napkins from the saunas about new deals. Uh, that, that doesn't happen anymore. But there, I'm on the board of the U.S. Russia Business Council and there are steady people, that, companies to stay on it year by year. Doesn't, it, make, it gets new members as much as it loses members. Uh, hi, my name is Diana Gebova, and thank you so much for the talk. I'm studying political science and Islamic studies at Columbia, and um, I'm a junior, so I have anxiety about like, career opportunities upon graduation, so um, your experiences really put me at ease. And, um, maybe, That's dangerous. Um, specifically to Jeremy Faust, maybe you have the most experience with this, but um, do you have any ideas other than the two programs you mentioned about internship opportunities and things to do over the summer? Um, so there are those two programs, I don't know, for more professional development or just Russian study? study professional Russian. development. Um, well, I know I was actually speaking, uh, you should ask people in this office because they know better than I do even, um, but there's also the Bourne Fellowship, which is more for research, um, but you kind of build it yourself. So there could be kind of a more working component more if it was research, um, so you could be abroad. I think they won't fund in Russia proper, but like you can go to Belarus and you, you know, you're not understanding necessarily Russia directly, but you're understanding parts of the culture. Mm -hmm. And also I will tell you, no one knows about Belarus in the United States. <laughs> so if you develop expertise in that area, you will be uniquely qualified. Um, but I will say, uh, don't worry so much about the anxiety, you know, I have anxiety up here, so I'm far <laughs> younger than everyone else here, um, and really just, if you see something, like, just apply to it, even if you think you don't have a shot, because often you will have a shot, um, and it's just kind of, like, overcome the, like, uh, self-doubt sometimes, it's really there are things like Alpha Bank too as a yeah. fellowship program that's pretty rich you might want to look into. Uh, I'd say the other thing, I think you heard it from the speakers, you don't really know what path you'll end up on and there's a lot of serendipity in here. <coughs> now if you're a good Russian studies person, it's pretty good, pretty good. So it doesn't matter, it's going to happen anyway. But you know, 
I think you think of one path, you discover something else, and it works. And as we said, I think you heard repeated, there's a lot of new opportunity. I just want to briefly share the magic of my stay in Russia. Um, I have to say, for context, uh, Steve Cohen was my professor at Princeton, and Randy uh, and I were working in, in Moscow uh, at the same time. And I was brought over um, through the U.S.-Russia Investment Fund in um, 1996, and I stayed till 08 so I segued into other things. I was a banker lending to small, medium-sized enterprises, uh, to entrepreneurs, and it was an extraordinary experience. I have not followed the Russian financial services um, uh, uh, um, since, really. I, I'm no longer directly involved with Russia, except through former colleagues and, and all. So. Um, I think what, I, and I do know Avon, Avon uh, has a program that must still be active at Alpha Bank. And uh, so uh, I, I waved the Russia flag for years with the American Chamber of Commerce in Moscow. And I would still do it, um, but I can't really tell you about opportunity. But um, I, I just follow, <laughs> they say follow your passion. Um, one thing does lead to the next, and it was extraordinary. I brought my little kids and the husband, and, and it, it, it was a bit bumpy at times, but it was life-changing for us all. So there's thank a, you. There's another idea I just have when you mention it. There's chambers of commerce all around these Russian cities, and they all, you know, if you're an American visiting, I mean, they will have you come and sit in, you will meet people, you will talk to business people, Small business owner. There was an Alpha Bank president in the in the Chamber of Commerce that I used to go to with um, in Barnaul, who I met. He called me up one day and said, "Would you give me English lessons?" I started giving him English lessons. You know, so there's lots of opportunity. Just go, take off. Well, I have, can I just add one more thing? Um, so this is a lot of the American. I mean, you guys know more about the uh, business climate, but a lot of American banks, especially, have moved away from Russia just because the sanctions make it so hard to do business. Like French banks, German banks, other European banks are still operating there, and they have internship programs, and I'm sure they have positions in Moscow, so that might be one area to look at. When you're an American, how do you reconcile your love for Russia or, um, international, ben or, or, or international good interests with your own passport and if you work for the government? I think it seems yes. philosophically more difficult than it is. Um, you know, if you're an American, you're an American. Um, if you love Russia, you you're interested in it from its culture and its history and its language. Um, a lot of places they're hiring for that. You know, when when the State Department <coughs> brought me on board and John Taft on board and John Byerly on board, we all knew we would end up in Russia. That was part of what was appealing to them. Um, they sent me to Berlin first. So they thought German would be good to learn, and like George Kennan, they went together. You know, so you got that. But so it wouldn't be that they're looking at you going, "Oh, why on earth does he like Russia so much?" Um, there is a degree, depending on where you're working, if it's for the government, you could like it too much. Um, the NSA. Um, God bless their hearts, I guess, but they're a very difficult agency to work for. Um, they, their biggest complaint was always they couldn't get people who spoke Russian. And, and I remember going there with a woman who was also studying Russian at Harvard, and they were asking, they said, you both speak Russian really well. We need to hire more people like you. Where did you learn Russia? Russia? We're at Russia? <laughs> oh, we don't want to hire them if they've been to Russia. <laughs> then we don't trust them. Um, so there, that agency would be a difficulty. Um, most of the rest, aside from them, they long ago learned it's fine. Uh, you know, they, they check your background and make sure they, they make you sign a form. You're not a member of the Communist Party or something. Like that. But you know, so there's not much of a Communist Yet Party left. the same form in Russia now. <laughs> yeah, but you know, so I don't think it's a big concern. Um, you wouldn't go over the top 
Um, you would know there's a line, depending on your public uh, posture and reputation, if you cross it one way or another, it could be problematic. Um, he's not here. Stevens on one side of that line that causes him a lot of issues. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I am on that line. Uh, so I'm sort of accepted by both sides on that back divide. But Stephen went over where he has a, a more difficult time academically it's difficult at parties, and professionally. And, you know, and that part's hard. You know, if Gorbachev is a close friend and Gorbachev falls out of favor, that's a problem. Um, Putin turned out when he was mayor in Leningrad, he was mean. He was not a close friend with anybody. Nobody had a problem with him. Nobody ever got close to him where you have that sense. You could have a little of that, but as I said, I wouldn't worry about it unduly. And I think they're going to want to hire you because you are passionate about this, have learned about this, and bring something to the table they want. Um, I'm a former Ukrainian citizen. Mm -hmm. Would that be a problem? Um, are you an American citizen yes. now? No. Nope. <laughs> um, in the old. In the old days, quote unquote, 15 years ago, maybe. Um, we've gotten much more sophisticated about that, too. He said, You can tell by my voice, I'm not from here. Actually, no American diplomat would accept that statement. I know people live in northern New Jersey, born in northern New Jersey, mm -hmm. sounds and just like sound that. just like you. Just and like people you. in Cleveland and the west side of Chicago. Yeah, you know, yeah, that doesn't matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you're, we're Ukrainian, you're an American now, you're an American now. Yeah. Also, for like security clearance issues, they're not going to like reject you outright. It could take you like two or three years. Like, oh I gosh. had a cousin who now works for a contractor, and she was the daughter of a foreign service officer. So she had a ton of foreign contacts. They were all the people who worked at the embassies of the United States. And it took her three years to get a clearance because they were like, you have all these contacts, Rio de Janeiro, T Tijuana. It's like, yes, they work at the embassy, but they still have to check them all. So it's really just waiting. But then, you know, you can get a, another job for a while. Hopefully it comes through and then move on. And also, I feel like your question kind of was also like more um, kind of if you like disagree with American policy and kind of supporting it. Yeah. And it's really nice for them. Yeah. So, I mean, I haven't really been in, obviously, like they have been, but. I would say, like, if you disagree with it, the, probably the biggest change you can make to it is influencing it from the inside rather than the outside. Um, so that's one thing to consider, even if you don't always agree with it. No, I think that's true. I think it's difficult in the current administration. Mm -hmm. um, on that one, so foreign service, um, we make use when you join, sign two pieces of paper. One, you're willing to go anywhere on the planet. Many people are daunted by that. Like, oh my God, what if they send me to Barnall? <laughs> so you're worried about that one. And the other one is you'll defend the policy of any president of the United States. And, and while people get nervous about both of those, in reality, they're hardly ever a problem. If you don't want to go to bar now, and you're going to perform horribly there, that's the last place I want to send you. So I may not send you to Paris, because you think that sounds like fun. But I'm going to look and find where could we use you that you would be effective, and by and large, most people don't go to places they don't really want to go to. You know, we don't force you to go to places. And often, when it's neutral, you're like, oh, okay. You go and you fall in love with it, because you never thought Sri Lanka would be an amazing place, and it's really an amazing place. Or Bardo. Yeah, or Bardo. <laughs> um, on the president part, you yeah. have the ability, whether it's state or defense or even the intelligence community, to steer your career quite a bit more than people think. Don't go to areas where the administration currently is diametrically opposed to what you believe. So if all of a sudden there's a big problem with Russia policy, if you're a Russia guy and you can't handle it, great year to do a, a training year, great year to go off to work on Capitol Hill for a year, we let you do that. Um, a great year to focus on a different region of the world for a while, and then when it shifts, you come back. I will say one more thing from the diplomatic point of view. My experience over a number of years with foreign service officers is they are remarkable at being diplomats. That they get, they must get this. I don't. I never went through it, but they get fabulous training 
on how to um, deal with difficult questions in different circumstances. There's one thing about talking about it to your spouse. There's another thing about talking to about your views with close friends, and a number another thing in meetings. But you, that I'm just so impressed with how foreign service officers are, are trained and live that life. And even and I, I guess I, some of them are good friends, so I can tell when their views are not uh, are they're not lying, but when they're being very careful about their views. But that's part of the training, and I think it's excellent training because it forces you to be intellectually consistent and intellectually honest and still be doing something in, in a career, in any career. As a lawyer, I have to take the side of my clients, even though some of them I don't particularly appreciate, but that's my job. And uh, that, that's sort of part of the real world, but I think in the Foreign Service you, you learn it better than any place. Let me comment on that and add one other thing I should put in there, too. We're horrible at training in a way, because what we do is we apprentice. So it's medieval training. You learn on the job how to do it from other people who are good at doing it. We don't send you so much to a school to learn it. Um, actually, we don't hire you to pay a lot of your own money to learn foreign affairs somewhere else, and then we'll teach you how to be a <laughs> diplomat so you get that. Uh, the other thing I didn't highlight, like, depending on if you want a federal career, um, they're very different as do you want a career that's more global or do you want one really focused? So you can go get a job at CIA as an analyst and literally only work on Siberia for your whole life. They'd be delighted. Um, you'll be living in Northern Virginia. It's quite pleasant. Four seasons, uh, cheaper cost of living in here. But if all you want to do is Siberia, they have that job. Um, if you go to the Foreign Service, we don't only want you to do Russia. You're not valuable enough to us if you only do Russia. And we may have you always doing things that may have an angle with Russia. So you did Russia, now you're doing arms control. You did Russia, and, or you did China, and now you're in Africa looking, what are the Chinese doing down here? Um, so depending on where you're interested in going, if it's more Russia focus or generic global languages, cultures, um, choose accordingly with that too. Because they're very different careers. Foreign service is very much live overseas half the time and immerse yourself totally in a couple cultures. Thank you very much. And may I suggest that we continue the discussion, please do not leave, but in a truly Russian manner, accompanied by food. Um, we have, it's Maslinica time, so we have Bill uh, Lee and Kevin, so please stay and continue as we uh, bring out um, more treats. Um, I just want to thank once again all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you for your um, time, for your passion, for your wisdom. Um, I'm sure we, um, everybody appreciates that and we'll definitely thank you. Please, please do not leave. We have a lot of food. <laughs> 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 no, no, I'm <laughs>